for many, many years. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. That was fun. Back to Brexit, however. The key cabinet ministers have come to some kind of agreement, but it's very unclear what, if anything, it really means. The International Trade Secretary was there, so presumably Liam Fox knows. He joins me now. You know, but you're not going to tell us. Yeah, that's a, a fair summary. Right. Well, let me ask you, first of all, about this word that's become... Everyone's talking about divergence, and to a lot of people it seems a very abstract thing. What is divergence and why does it matter? Well, what's important is Britain's freedom to act differently in the future according to different circumstances. Now, if you look at Britain's trading performance back in 2005, 2006, about 56% of Britain's exports of goods and services went to the European Union. That's now down to 43%. And the reverse is true of the rest of the world. We're now exporting more to the rest of the world outside Europe. Now, the key part of that is, if you look at what the IMF have said, for example, they say that 90% of global growth in the next 10 to 15 years will be outside and Europe. So, so we must have, so we need to orientate ourselves towards those markets. Towards those big economies. That's not to say that the European Union will not remain in a very important export market for the United Kingdom, but we also need to be free to orientate ourselves towards the areas and where there will be more trade. And to do that, we need to do things very differently. Well, we need to be free to take some of those decisions for ourselves. Now, there's a lot of talk, as we've heard this morning, about customs union. The key thing about a customs union, as you described earlier, is that it puts a big frontier around Europe. Yep. And it means that we all apply the same duties to things coming in. Now, first of all, we would like to be able to alter those. For example, with developing countries, we'd like to be able to cut some of those duties that the EU currently mm. applies. We couldn't do that if we were inside a customs okay. union. I absolutely understand the ambition. What seems to me to be borderline dishonest is to say that we can have all of that and a generous free trade agreement with the EU they are absolutely clear that is, to use Donald Tusk's word, pure illusion. Well, we'll wait and see where the negotiations take us. Because remember, if you're looking at what's in our interests, you also have to look at what's in the EU's interests. The EU has a massive yeah. surplus yeah. with the United Kingdom on goods, something like £100 billion in the last year. To not have that free trade agreement with the United Kingdom would mean that European exporters, European businesses, were at a huge but disadvantage. They, they have spent 40 years creating a rule-based, law-based new system. And now we're saying we want to diverge from your laws where it suits us, stick with it where it suits us, thank you very much. And they see that as a direct and serious threat to their way of, 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 of living and creating this union. That's why they are all unanimously and very, very clearly saying you are not going to cherry pick. If you try, we will keep you out of our markets. Well, we'll see. That's the, certainly the opinion of the Commission, and I understand why that's the opinion of the Commission. They're there as the court guardians of the treaties. Mm. But whether that's what the member states Sim will want similar message in terms from of... Berlin well, we'll see what Paris. we'll see as we go through what governments do, because this is a question of whether do you put political ideology yes. or the prosperity of your people first in these negotiations. Well, here's the Taoiseach, Leo Var Varica. The EU is a set menu restaurant, not a la carte. It's not possible for the UK to be aligned to the EU when it suits and not when it doesn't. And there's a national leader saying exactly what they're saying in the centre as well. And I mean, you say they're going to change their mind, they will fold in the end. But that is pure faith on your part, isn't it, really? You have no idea whether they will. No, say we'll make our case. And we make our case not just for what's good for the United Kingdom, but what we also think is good for the European Union. It doesn't make any sense for the European Union to tie itself up in tariffs where it will be sending more money to the UK exchequer mm. than we'd be sending in the other direction. That doesn't make sense for European businesses, European consumers, European workers. Mm. So we will ultimately have to sit down very hard-headedly, and we understand the position they're starting from. We will have to work out what is good, what's in our mutual benefit, and considering the trends so in the wider global the, economy. The global economy is moving away from this concept of hardwired harmonisation yeah. to the, concepts of equivalence. The idea is that we, we start off in the same position and then over time we, we diverge where it suits us. And there'll have to be some kind of body which decides how that works and so on. But over time we are going to be a different kind of economy and therefore a different kind of society. Just tell me what kind of difference to Britain you'd like to see in 10 years' time. Well, First of all, you're asking me to uh, accept the assumption of the question that that's what we've agreed. We'll set it out, is what you've agreed. We'll set out what we've agreed. Number when the Prime Minister sets it all out, over the papers. The, I don't think that was number 10. I think you'll find when the Prime Minister sets it out on Friday, you see the full context. But leaving that mm. aside, mm. what do I want to see? I want to see the United Kingdom able to make its own decisions 
that um, allow us, as I said, to vary what yeah. we do in terms of tariffs for developing countries. I want to see us being able to take uh, the opportunities um, with countries like China to be able to look at service agreements. And remember, just to put this into context for people watching this program, by 2030, China will have 220 cities of more than a million people. The whole of Europe will have 35. That's the scale okay, That's the scale of the, of the change. change. All right. Uh, Jeremy Hunt says, the central common understanding is there will be areas and sectors of industries where we agree to align our regulations with European regulations. The automotive industry is perhaps the obvious example because of the supply chain but it will be on a voluntary basis. We will, as a sovereign power, have the right to choose to diverge and what we won't be doing is accepting changes in rules because the EU unilaterally decides to make. That is broadly speaking where we are, is it not? Well, it's a great try, that's the third try, but I won't be setting out what we've agreed. But I think so it's, fair to say, it's fair to say that we want to be rule makers in our own country, not rule takers. Mm. Now, if you're a part of the single market, you have to take the EU's rules. If you're in a customs union, you have to take the EU's rules. Now, but, sorry, sorry Jer Jeremy Hunt said that after the event. Yes, well, I was at the meeting and I'm not saying what we decided. Uh, at the meeting, Are the you Prime saying Minister will set it up. I'm not saying anything. Right. I'm saying you'll have to wait, Andrew. That's five times, very good try. Um, we will set out, as the Prime Minister sets out on Friday, the full details. What is very clear, however, from the referendum is that people voted to take control of our money and our laws and our borders. Will any arrangement that we enter into actually honour that commitment? Now, this, so, so, so what you're saying mm -hmm. is that we will have full freedom to diverge if we want to? What I'm saying is we have because to have if, full I don't freedom what you're if you're to have that. full freedom to have an independent trade policy. Now, if you this debate we've been having this morning, and I was challenged on that by Keir Starmer, um, on the customs union. So we're going to leave the customs union. I think both parties are agreed on that. Labour say they want to join a customs union. What does that mean? Is it like Turkey, which has a customs union but only in goods? but not in agriculture, not in services, not in finance. Is that what we want for Britain? Will we take rules in when certain the, sectors, but not in others? Will we have freedom in certain sectors, not in others? He's been much clearer than you've been. And um, above all, this is about the kind of society we are going to be. Do you still think it's, <clears throat> it must be much easier to hire and fire people, for instance, in the future? Is that where you're going, a more deregulated economy? No, what we've said is that we need to be able to adapt to the global economy it, as it changes. Is that what you think? In terms of workers' rights, no, it's not. In terms of things like the digital economy, do we need to be able to move and adapt to that? Yes, we do. Can we do that if we're aligned to the European Union? No, we can't, because countries like France will simply reject some of you're the being, data arguments. You're being very cuddly. Um, let me remind you what you said. It's too difficult to hire and fire in this country. It's intellectually unsustainable to believe that workplace rights should remain untouchable. Do you still believe that? No, we've come to an agreement. You don't believe that. You've no, we've, come, we've come to an agreement as a government that we will maintain those rights. And I'll tell you why. Because as part of the rollover of the EU agreements that we're already party to, those rights are already entrenched in those and we said we would respect those as we rolled okay. them over. Isn't the truth that this is the beginning of a journey? We have this agreement, if we can get an agreement, we've talked about that, and then we see what happens over time. Once we can diverge, we can diverge as much as we like. Michael Gove said as much. This is the beginning of a journey to a very different Britain. This is a less regulated Britain. That's why the EU are so frightened of it. They think that we are going to be, as it were, a kind of Hong Kong or Singapore on their northern border. Well, we've got to stop seeing Europe as the centre of the debate. We've got to orientate mm. the United Kingdom. They're the people having well, a negotiation well, we've got, with right well, now. We're also mm. talking to the rest of the world. I don't begin this debate by saying, how much of the EU do I take with me? Okay. I begin this <clears> debate by saying, what do we need to do to orientate Britain towards those very big right. opportunities in the global economy that will guarantee that we can earn the money in the future so that future generations can pay for the public services that they want? Now, you, you, you heard uh, Keir Starmer talking about Labour backing for these motions by Tory rebels. They have the numbers to blow a massive hole right the way through this process. What's your message to them? Well, as a former whip, first of all, I'm always very wary about parliamentary arithmetic debates. Leaving that aside, in terms of the message that you ask about, I would say to my colleagues that Theresa May has kept a broad range of views on the European issue in her cabinet for a reason. We because sat she down. Loses power if she does. We sat. We oh. sat down. Mm. We, with those differing views, we set. We looked at the issues. We looked at the options, and we came to an agreement that we are all happy with. And I think that when the rest of the parliamentary party hears on Friday, as the prime minister sets it out, what we she's going to win over Anna Subri, do you think? Well, I hope that they will have an open mind 
and listen to what the Prime Minister says, because I think that what the Prime Minister will set out will deal with a lot of the reservations that they've had. This is your legislation, this trade bill. Why are you delaying it? Uh, we would, we're looking to see... You're delaying it because what, you're going to lose on this amendment, no, aren't you? No, we, we want to persuade our colleagues uh, of the merits of our argument mm. before Same we thing, take yeah. the bill forward. And we're not going to do it um, on the basis of what suits the opposition. We'll do it on what we think gives us the, you, the passing of the legislation because it's very important. You can't delay it for much longer, can well, you? we need to get the legislation through because if we were not to have a deal with the European Union, we wouldn't be able to protect British business from, anti, from dumping, mm. for example, uh, or, or massive subsidies. And I think we need to protect British business. The Labour Party who voted against this mm. bill will have to think twice or they'll leave British, British business like steel unprotected. So you're saying it's our way or no way at all? Well, we've set out, Something what, or bust. We've set out what we need to do to, mm. we believe, honour the result of the referendum to ensure that we've got control of our borders and our laws and our money. Uh, and those who don't want to honour those will need to explain to the British people why they feel they don't have to do so. OK, can we talk about the transition period? Presumably, um, if this new idea, this accord, whatever it is, is turned down flat by the EU, there will be no transition period either. Well, we, again, we go into this negotiation on the assumption that uh, the Council in March will get an agreement on implementation because we've got an agreement on how we move forward. Um, I still, as I said earlier, I still think that the rational way forward mm. is for the EU to come to an agreement on trade with the United Kingdom that's in our mutual interest. I don't see why we would not do that. And if we're okay. to do that, we need a transition. And are of course, you, if are we're you to going to be able to sign trade deals with the rest of the world during the transition period? Yes, that's our intention. You will be able to. To sign and to agree that's different from implement, of course, because if we were within um, the customs union in the transitional period, we couldn't implement a new agreement. But we'd want to negotiate and sign um, so that we could implement at the end of, of the implementation period itself. So and you have a deal with, with Donald Trump's America and with Australia and otherwise before the end of the transition period. It will all be there. We will know what the deal is and you'll be able to sign it and then implement it immediately we leave. Well, we've got 14 uh, working groups working with 21 different countries mm. at the present time. We want to be able to take those negotiations as far as we can during that implementation period. Not to do so would leave the United yeah. Kingdom incapable of making plans for our final Brexit position, and that would be unacceptable. Let's turn to an uh, interesting domestic issue. Uh, your colleague, Vice Chairman of the Party, Ben Bradley, uh, tweeted this um, after saying um, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn had been involved in spy allegations, I accept I caused upset and distress to Jeremy Corbyn by my untrue and false allegations. And he's given money which has gone to a food bank in his constituency. Was that the right thing to happen? Yes, if you say something that is untrue, you have to say so. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, as somebody who's actually won a libel mm. case um, at the High Court, it's uh, infinitely better not to have to go through not any of to, that. Not to have to go through that experience. Now, he said that uh, Jeremy Corbyn had betrayed his country. Gavin Williamson, your successor as Defence Secretary, said that Jeremy Corbyn met foreign spies and that is a betrayal of this country. Is that true? Do you well, agree with him? I think that it's perfectly legitimate for the media, for the press, for other politicians to ask questions about it. What's not He's acceptable not asking questions. is He's to say saying that Jeremy, Do you think Jeremy Corbyn betrayed this country? Well, I think that the Labour left during the Cold War um, were extremely unhelpful to this country. We believe that we should see off communism. We believe that we should see off okay, the tyranny that's not quite of what the I'm, East. I'm asking you, did he betray his country? I don't think that uh, you can use the word, I would use the word betray. So Gavin on Williamson that, is wrong. But I, would think, I certainly think that the Labour left were the Soviet Union's useful idiots during that period. So Gavin Williamson said he, that Jeremy Corbyn had betrayed this country. Should he apologise? Well, I think that um, he's, we, this is part of the lively mm. debate that we have. It's not necessarily a word I would use, but I certainly believe, and I think it's true, that Jeremy Corbyn and others were very useful to the Soviet Union during the Cold War because okay, they I'm undermined, gonna, I'm gonna try they undermined more, the arguments try, of the West. i try one more time. Should Gavin Williamson apologise to Jeremy Corbyn for saying that he has betrayed this country? Well, I think in, in the broader sense, he was undermining the security of our country oh, by siding yes or no. with the Soviet Union in that argument, and I think that was very damaging to the country. Luckily, it was uh, our side of the argument, not Jeremy Corbyn's, that won the day. So you do think he betrayed his country? I think he certainly undermined the Labour left were undermining the security of the United Kingdom by their one-sided disarmament and their very clear preference 
for a Soviet-style communism during that period. Fortunately, we beat them sure then. I'm still not sure whether you think Gavin Williamson should apologise or not for saying that Jeremy Corbyn betrayed this country. Well, I, I don't believe that, that uh, it's, it's, it's necessary to apologise, but it's very clear that Jeremy Corbyn and his fellow left-wingers were undermining the case for our security, which I think is the point that Gavin yes, Williamson but no, was making. Yes, but no, but yes, but no, but. That's how we end. Thank you very much indeed, Liam Fox. Let's take